There is a city nestled on the shores of the Atlantic that shelters seamen and ships from brutal winds, tides, and storms. A harbor that shelters its identity from the ravages of time with pride and with care. There is pride in the rich history of the city. There is care for the beauty of its buildings and the well-being of its citizens. The city is New Bedford, Massachusetts. It is a city that listens to the conversations that its buildings carry on with each other and with the waters that hug its shores in the distance. It is a city that hears. It hears of its own beginnings, its prosperous and romantic years as the whaling capital of the world and as a thriving cotton milling center. It hears stories of hard times when the city was not strong and it wants to stop listening. But then it hears the proud and caring voices telling of preservation and renewed vitality. The city hears these voices and listens. The city has a history, a long and proud history of daring seamen braving the raging seas to light the world with candles made from the oil of the whale. By 1850, two-thirds of the American whaling fleet sailed out of New Bedford Harbor. That percentage increased until the last days of the whaling industry, uh, an industry that was worldwide in its scope and that uh, supplied the city with its economic base, even if men did not go whaling themselves. Most of those gainfully employed in the city were involved in trades that supported the industry. As Emerson once said, the city was no closer to the whales than any other, but they hugged an oil cask like a brother in New Bedford. Whaling was king, and New Bedford became a city of grandeur as early Quaker restraints on worldly goods were cast aside. You have, again, in the eight, beginning in the early 1820s, uh, uh, expenditures on furniture, on, on uh, domestic architecture, on clothing, in a way that would have startled the old line Quakers of uh, even two decades earlier. Most dramatically revealed in New Bedford, this occurs in the large costly homes thrown up, largely by whaling merchants or whaling masters, certainly all, as Melville said, based on money harpooned and dragged up from the bottom of the sea. To the sensitive listener, these houses compose stories of gracious living on a hill overlooking the harbor in the 19th century. The whaling industry began to decline during the Civil War, and with the discovery of petroleum, retreated as the industrial age of New Bedford began. The riches of the land overtook those of the sea with cotton mills and factories. The textile mills of New Bedford's industrial age provided jobs for large numbers of immigrants and further expanded the fortunes of residents, leading the city into a second period of great wealth and growth. Perhaps uh, the best known quotation about New Bedford to those that love it is the famous quotation of Rickardson that this is the city of palaces. And indeed, it has been a city of palaces, not only in the late whaling period, uh, the period uh, of the 40s and 50s, but even more so in the great 
uh, period of the late 19th century when the mills began to pour money into the New Bedford economy. And what we find is a real ebullience in architecture. Fancy detail, interesting, intricate work of all kinds. We find houses that are really palaces. New Bedford was a city of working people. This is the era when New Bedford became a city of great, large neighborhoods. But in the 1920s, New Bedford industries, plagued by striking labor forces, succumbed to the economic decay of the Depression years. And the beauty created by wealth and industrious personalities gradually began to give way to deterioration and destruction. I have really felt a, a, quite a sense of loss in what New Bedford did leave behind when all of this degradation actually was going on. My mother's family are from New Bedford and I had spent much of my early childhood, in my, all the summers here, and knew New Bedford in its heyday when all the lovely big houses and the beautiful gardens were still flourishing up on County Street. That, of course, died off in, when the Depression came. And the Depression was everywhere, of course, and deep for everyone. But uh, somehow or other, New Bedford had been such a beautiful city and such a lovely way of life here that it was appalling to see what it had fallen into and how very, very, uh, sad this area was, but the city just gradually deteriorated. It was just a, a very depressed time. New Bedford had sort of an amazing attitude of uh, defeatism and uh, inferiority. They just felt its day was over and that there was nothing left. In about 1960, urban renewal program was started in New Bedford. The renewal program, of course, was demolition and rebuild. If you demolish the old buildings and build the new, you no longer have New Bedford. It's, it's just anywhere. I still can, in my mind, hear the, the huge front door slamming. It had a very particular kind of, uh, of noise when it was closed, and I can still see the house sitting with uh, snow all over it. And it was splendid. It was really splendid. It was a splendid house. The value of a rich heritage faded in the minds of people and lay forgotten. But the sparks of history do not die so easily, but linger on in the eyes of a few who can still glimpse the meaning of the past and can understand its relationship to the present. Historic preservation began in New Bedford, and the sparks of history lighted the paths leading to a more positive present. WAIL stands for the Waterfront Historic Area League, and it's a private, non-profit preservation organization that was begun in 1962 by uh, individuals who were concerned about the deterioration of buildings in the Waterfront Historic District. This area had been the center of uh, New Bedford. It was, it was the commercial core of the city in the days of whaling. And it was uh, deteriorating badly, and no one seemed to be doing anything about it. Uh, and so whale was formed. I think the uh, motive for the effort to revitalize the Waterfront Historic District has always been uh, twofold. Uh, the first is, of course, preservation. The buildings are historically and architecturally important, and people feel that as a part of our heritage, they ought to be preserved. I think that uh, always very close uh, in our mind has been the economic value that this district has for the city. This is a historic commercial area, and the economics of preservation has also been uh, a factor from the beginning. Well, uh is a nonprofit organization 
which started uh, about 15 years ago until the development and the uh, authorization for community development funding, there were really no city vol uh, funds involved, nor were they available. But when we made a policy decision that we wanted to make physical improvements and visible signs of improvement with the use of community development funds, then we could form a partnership with them. Uh, basically what the public improvements are, are new street lighting, uh, decorative type street lighting, uh, sidewalks, trees, all of the amenities uh, that would aesthetically improve the areas. With that kind of leadership, we then came in and said, let's pick some key buildings like the Rodman Candle Works or the move of the Andrew Robeson House or the uh, Rodman House Glass Museum. And as a nonprofit organization, we will begin the rehabilitation projects on those special buildings and we assembled money from the, the private sector and public sectors to, to really force the rehabilitation of those buildings. Uh, in some cases, we'll go through, such as the Robin Candle Works, the entire rehabilitation, interior and exterior. In other cases, such as the Robeson House, we will concentrate our effort on exterior restoration, and then we intend to sell it to someone who, having a use for the building, will continue the process on the inside. Once these nonprofit buildings were developed, we're now starting to see purely private investment as the uh, property owners in the district, sensing uh, the economic uh, rebirth of the district, start to uh, put money into their buildings, start to open up new businesses or expand existing businesses. considered the building, it was uh, a tavern with the windows boarded up with flashing signs in the windows. We knew that it had a character just from looking at the outside. The inside, we weren't able to see a lot of the woodwork that we finally uncovered in the renovation processes because they had built another room inside, the main room. But we knew just from looking at the outside and the architecture that it was a very special place to be. Once we opened and got a little bit of publicity and got a little bit of name in the area, people started to come down at uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, through the nighttime. And it seemed to change the area into a more viable economic area within itself. The Novetta Glass Society was looking for a place to house its grown collection. When this house was offered to us, we grabbed it immediately, and the house has been uh, completely renovated. We are housing one of the greatest collections of uh, glass manufactured in one individual factory. The uh, history of the glass covers a 90-year period, and it's known throughout the entire world. It was felt that it would be a moving, living, breathing thing to bring the factory back into the area. And by luck, the old born building was vacant and they built the blowing rooms. Now people go in there to see them make glass and they're amazed. I think that what we've seen happen is uh, a total revitalization. We took the initiative and put about $2 million of public community development funds into the project. Uh, when the public funds were successful, it stimulated a tremendous amount of private investment, which is probably at least double or triple the public investment up until now. And what has happened is there's been 45 new or expanded businesses and well over 200 new jobs created in the district and has also given uh, a rebirth of pride to the citizens of New Bedford, but has brought in uh, what we now have is uh, over 700,000 people came here this year uh, as tourists. There's no question that the revival has, has been the catalyst in bringing tourists into New Bedford. Uh, before the uh, revitalization happened in 1976, uh, we were averaging about 200,000 people a year. Uh, this year we went to 700,000 people uh, it was a 40% increase over last year. We had fairs and festivals almost every weekend. 
uh, during summer months, and we offered concerts on Thursday night, uh, also music on Wednesday evening. I think what's happened in New Bedford is that uh, because of the activity and because now the people in New Bedford have a place to go and join with the tourists and enjoying these activities, that people have developed a more positive attitude towards the city. If you're happy in what you're doing and where you are, it makes much mu life much more enjoyable. And I think this is really what's happened here. People for years and years feel depressed, they thought this was the end of the world and so forth. And now, uh, when you go to the events, people are talking very positively. They're looking forward to new things happening. Uh, I think that uh, industry has uh, also reflected this in their coming to New Bedford. And so I think that overall, uh, how you feel about things uh, has an awful lot uh, to do with how your lifestyle is. I love living in the city of New Bedford. It's a very progressive city, and they have historical things in the city, too. And I'm, that's why I'm here today, because I love the city. I think the preservation of history affects my life. And it's interesting. It's interesting to meet the people that come here. We have people from all walks of life that come here. It's nice to see people and, and get compliments for the people. The resourceful spirit of their wailing ancestors was reawakened in New Bedford residents. A handful of people had a vision, and worked, and watched it grow. It's very satisfactory to see the people, the townspeople, move back in to the city, to take an interest in the city, and I think that we have helped that. I think we've taken buildings which were, um, in several cases, due for the bulldozer, and uh, we've brought them back to life, and we've made them a commercially viable enterprise. And I think that's a very important part of preservation today. There are very few people who can afford a museum quality restoration for restoration's sake. Well, I think uh, everyone who's been working on the revitalization of this district realizes the uh, importance of the fishing industry. This area has always served as the support base for New Bedford's fleet. Uh, 100 and 200 years ago, that was a whale fleet. Uh, half of the buildings continue to outfit New Bedford ships. The ones that are not used for fishing, what's left over, are the ones that we try and uh, recycle so that the economics of the Waterfront Historic District are now divided between fishing and tourism. And that produces some conflict, but it in our opinion, produces a very lively and, and vital area. appreciate the attention. They like the buildings being fixed up. They are proud of the fact that they are the descendants of a two-century-old heritage. The atmosphere began to change in New Bedford, and more expansive plans were developed. We concentrated a lot of activity on this 14-block area, and when it started to work, the people in the downtown looked at that. They noticed it noticed that uh, new businesses were coming, that the businesses were healthy, that rents were higher than in the downtown. And rather than our having to tell them that the downtown ought to be revitalized, they said, well, we ought to have some of that action in the downtown. And they came to us to help them. So it was teaching by example, which is something that uh, works better than uh, some of the other preservation methods. If you can get people thinking in a positive vein uh, and not feeling down on themselves, on their city, on their government, uh, this has a tremendous impact on what can be accomplished. And once they're convinced, then they join and become real proponents of restoration, preservation, uh, or whatever it might be. I think if, if there's a lesson to come out of the experience that we've had in New Bedford, it's what can be done if the private citizens of a neighborhood 
if involved nonprofit organizations, and if city government, specifically the Office of Historic Preservation, decide that they want to work cooperatively on a problem. This partnership exists in New Bedford. What you end up with is a feeling of trust between people in a district and local government, a feeling of pride, feeling that there are people in, who inhabit City Hall who care about you. The mayor created the Office of Historic Preservation, uh, and our duties were to help restore the waterfront district as well as other areas around the city. The city is not into uh, a preservation philosophy that would make all of its restoration be museum-type restoration. Most of our people here are not wealthy people, and so our philosophy is that um, whatever you can afford is what we want you to do, as long as it's uh, in the direction of preservation. Our office is involved in several financial programs, and our loan programs and grant programs are extremely flexible. And so we can work uh, any kind of a situation with an individual homeowner. It's attracting a lot of people to get assistance from our office, both technical and financial, because uh, there isn't a lot of red tape. We found the house in abandoned condition, and uh, it looked so beautiful, and we thought that it might have been destroyed. And the only thing to do was to try and secure the property. When we bought this house, I had always wanted an old house, but never in the city. And actually, we found there's more a sense of community here than there is out in the outlying towns. And you know your neighbors. We have restaurants. We're right within walking distance of the stores and the library. Too many homes are being run down and knocked down. You know? We've lost a lot of old homes. I was determined to have this place. I liked it so much. A total resurrection began in New Bedford as structures were preserved and restored all over the city. Our direction in, in uh, the preservation office in New Bedford is not solely historic preservation of historic neighborhoods. Uh, our direction has lately been going into conservation of, of uh, any type of neighborhoods. For instance, we're, we're working on uh, neighborhoods that largely consist of three-deckers, three-family houses that were built during the textile era. And people are now uh, rehabilitating those houses to look like they did when they were built perhaps around the turn of the century. I wanted to fix the house up because uh, it needed a lot of work, number one, and had to be done, and I wanted to do it once and not have to be worried about it five years from now or ten years from now, just do a good job and, and have it set. The Office of Historic Preservation made me realize that there was history to the house, even though it wasn't a very old home or a mansion like some of the ones downtown, but that it had history for what it was, a, a three tenement house and for the role that it played in the community. They made me realize that there were certain aspects of the architecture of the house that I could sort of highlight that would bring it out and uh, sort of add a little bit of something to the house and to the street, and I was really, you know, kind of excited about that. We try to change people's attitudes in many ways. Um, we project them into the history and period of their own building. Uh, we show them parts of the city. We tell them stories and anecdotes about the city that they perhaps didn't know, and people are just astounded. I think the most important thing is to have your own people in the city recognize what they have. When I walk down the streets and I see the men fixing up the houses, I feel proud because they uh, make the houses look like they were before. We have a citywide restoration program uh, which has created and stimulated an awful lot of renovations. And those people who have not even participated in the program, many, many people have restored their houses on their own. It's done more to create a very positive feeling in people about their city, about themselves, and about where they live, and what they want to do, and what they want to make of their neighborhood. So I think it's been probably the best program that we could have entered. The city speaks, speaks through its old buildings that live on through new uses, through its vital neighborhoods carved out of history. Everywhere we hear and see statements of strength, 
the neighborhoods of New Bedford call to mind and confirm the creativity and pride of the society that built them and allowed them to last.